Hi, everyone. Uh, I first would like to warmly welcome you all to our session uh, to discuss surveillance uh, in the MENA region. My name is Marwa Patavta, and I'm the MENA policy manager at Access Now. Um, maybe I'll give a quick introduction before I give the floor to our speakers about the uh, topic of the session today. Um, some of you know, some of you probably don't. Um, Earlier this year, during RightsCon 2021, uh, we launched uh, the MENA Surveillance Coalition or the MENA Coalition to Combat Surveillance, uh, co-led by the Gulf Center for Human Rights and Access Now. And we have a number of wonderful members of the coalition, uh, starting from Human Rights Watch, Frontline Defenders, SMEX, uh, Josa Massad from Egypt and a number of other organizations um, and our purpose is to combat the proliferation of surveillance technologies in the MENA region by holding both governments and private companies that are providing these technologies accountable to the um, human rights violations facilitated by the use of such technologies. And I'm sure many of you, uh, I mean, since we launched the, the the coalition, it's been an interesting couple of months, uh, starting from the Pegasus Project revelations, uh, from For Forbidden Stories, Amnesty International, which revealed um, the, the depth of um, the use of Pegasus spyware sold by the Israeli company NSO Group. Um, very recently, the US Department of Commerce blacklisted um, Kandiru, another Israeli company, and the NSO group for uh, facilitating and enabling governments to expand uh, their transnational repression. We lost Khalid on that note. Uh, on Tuesday, the Apple also made a major announcement that they are suing the NSO group uh, for using and exploiting um, iPhone uh, software uh, running a program to install and infect the devices of activists and journalists with the Pegasus spyware. And also, um, very recently, earlier this month, the US Court of Appeals rejected a motion by the NSO group um, to throw out a WhatsApp uh, case against it. Uh, rejecting that the NSO's defense or claim that it could, you know, claim foreign sovereign immunity. So these are very interesting developments that are scrutinizing NSO group and open the door, uh, hopefully for more regulation and accountability and push the surveillance industry to become uh, more aware and feel the heat that if they're selling their surveillance technologies to um, governments to facilitate human rights abuses, then the, the, the days of profiting of human rights violations uh, without accountability might be over. So um, before I start with questions, I want to first give the, the chance to our speakers to introduce themselves. Uh, if we can do it that way, instead of me introducing you, maybe I'll start with Khalid. Khaled, you're muted. That is uh, topical. Uh, my name is Khalid Ibrahim. I'm the executive director of the Gulf Center for Human Rights, uh, which was established in 2011 to support and protect uh, human rights defenders across uh, the uh, Gulf region and neighboring countries. And now we are working in the whole MENA region. Yes. Thank you, Khaled. And thanks for joining us, Mohammed. Um, uh, thanks, Marwa. Thanks, Had. My name is Mohamed Al Maskati. I am the MENA Digital uh, Protection Coordinator, and I recently uh, was the researcher on the biggest source of uh, against uh, six Palestinian human rights defenders. Thank you for joining us, Maskati. And actually, I'll start with you. So let us start with the latest surveillance news from the region. Um, and as you mentioned, frontline defenders published its, in its investigation, uh, which was peer reviewed by Citizen Lab and Amnesty International Security Lab, um, the hacking of six Palestinian human rights defenders using um, the NSO group's Pegasus spyware. So can you share with us um, the main findings of your investigation and how it came under your radar? 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Marwa. Actually, it, it started with um, I get a call from one of the researchers that based in Jerusalem, and he is uh, working with Al Haq. Um, Al Haq is the main organization in Palestine, and they are really active with International Criminal Code, and they are also active on uh, documenting cases not uh, only against the Israeli government, but also against the uh, Palestinian authorities. Um, and I was, um, I, I, I was not intent to, to, to do a um, uh, scan for his devices based on Pegasus, but it was, um, I mean, it was accidentally that we said, okay, let's, let's try to, to do this and we I found that he is infected with Pegasus. Um, the, the finding was in the beginning search with uh, Citizen Lab and um, they confirmed that it is a Pegasus and it was um, July uh, 2020 and we think that definitely there is other peoples and there is other victims. Um, so I start to, to scan 75 um uh, iphones devices and uh, the idea to to see if there is other people get infected and and we find five extra peoples uh, from different organizations uh during our investigation um the israeli government put six organization in blacklist and that's also one of the alert um and they put them in the blacklist in inside uh, Israelis territory only and that's in the beginning before we releasing our report actually the night we are releasing our reports we uh, we get uh, a news from uh, the organizations that they will this is be extended to the West Bank and um, we are not sure if they know about our investigation we are not sure if any information but definitely these six organizations is under attacks from long time and they um, they were um, uh, attacked by the Israelis uh, and Palestinian authorities for a long time. Uh, the main thing is that um, who is else? I mean, that's the big question. Definitely there is other people get infected by, by, with Pegasus and definitely people with Android also get infected, but we didn't had uh, we didn't have the chance to do the to, to scan their devices. Uh, because the way is Android working is totally different than um, iPhone. Uh, we uh, we have really thanks to to, to Citizen Lab and um, Amnesty Tech Lab that their finding help us to 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 digging more on these issues and uh, we are, are still working on other cases in other countries actually and um, definitely we will come with um, a lot of finding about uh, how big SOS is infecting uh, human rights defenders and journalists and violate their uh, privacy um and this is i mean this is what i can uh, share about uh I mean, it take from us uh, three weeks, uh, and we we were also happy to say that we cooperated with Access Now. Uh, thanks to you, Marwa, I cooperated with other organization uh, who released later a statement to support also uh, the the finding to support to starting investigation uh, against NSO and targeting the the Palestinian human rights defenders. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. And indeed, there was an interesting discussion uh, between the overlap uh, about the overlap between your timeline and the timeline of the investigation, and also the timeline of the Israeli authorities designating the organizations as terrorists. Um, and I think, regardless of this is true or not, uh, meaning that the Israeli authorities rushed with their uh, designation because they knew of the findings of the report. There is absolutely undeniable link between surveillance as a violation of privacy and the wider assault on civil society and a plethora of other fundamental rights and freedoms. And I would love actually to move the question to Khaled um, to expand a bit more on the impact of the surveillance technologies on activists, on journalists, 
uh, and civil society organizations in the region. This uh, new report is not, as we all know, is not the first and probably won't be the last. Uh, and there has been a number of reports in recent years, starting from 2016, uh, where mainly Gulf governments have been using Pegasus spyware uh, to monitor their uh, dissidents and activists. So Khalid, can you share also a bit more uh, about the impact of surveillance technologies on activists in the Gulf region and beyond? You're mute, Khalid. You hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you, Marwan. Thanks uh, to Mohammed for all his efforts uh, to support the event that's across the MENA region. I think his work is important. Uh, now, when we want to talk about the uh, Gulf and neighboring countries, really it's a long story, but to put it in context, I, I have to say that the traditional media, usually owned by governments or by on occasions by the intelligence themselves. So people went to social media and networks to express their views about public affairs. And then governments created the cyber crimes law to imprison activists and to monitor online activism. But it is never ended here. They started to invest millions, millions of US dollars on uh, uh, important, the most sophisticated uh, uh, soft and hard hardwares to uh, really monitor uh, all our uh, online uh, activities. And really, we paid a happy price. We have people who are in prison. We have many examples. Uh, and uh, this is uh, very serious. You are talking about the freedom of expression on the net. Now, freedom of expression outside the net is very much uh, uh, controlled, limited. We have a lot of restrictions. And when you talk about the internet, uh, now it is very risky with all these uh, 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 stories of uh, people uh, getting attacked. And now, the, 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 the big issue for us, as a Mohammed put it in one bigger question, who's next? Who's left? Who's next? We have only limited resources. We have only the world to uh, promote human rights, to promote freedom of expression on the net. But oppressive governments, they have everything, all the resources, and they are investing millions, as I said, to monitor our activities. And that is putting us at a really imminent risk. And that is why we are trying together to share resources and to uh, find ways to uh, confront the uh, oppressive governments in order to uh, give safety to online activism and uh, give a protection to human rights defenders and bloggers and journalists. Um, thank you, Khalid. And if I may add, you know, the first, I think the first report that came out about the NSO group, uh, because of spyware, was on the use of this particular spyware by the Emirati government to uh, surveil and monitor Ahmad Mansour, who's currently uh, holding uh, or imprisoned, I think on a 10 year imprisonment sentence in yeah. under inhumane conditions. Do you yeah. wanna add more on that Khalid? Or? Yeah, well, Ahmed Mansour, my colleague, he's uh, on the advisory board of the Gulf Center for Human Rights on the advisory board of the MENA section of Human Rights uh, Defender. Very reliable defender. He used uh, Twitter to support uh, prisoners of a conscious uh, Emirat. And uh, really, we could say for history, he's the first victim of Pegasus project. And they managed to hack into his phone, to hack into his uh, Twitter account. They managed to provide uh, for the security, uh, state security apparatus, many information uh, illegally uh, taken from his various accounts, including his Gmail. On one occasion, uh, they went uh, to his phone, they sent a message uh, in cooperation with the national provider, part of the government, of course, uh, and they took control of his phone. They got a message from uh, SMS from Twitter. They got control of uh, his Twitter account, and it took us many days to uh, get uh, back his uh, Twitter account. And then, uh, as you know, on the 20th of March, 2017, he was uh, arrested, uh, disappeared, tortured, 
and in a short trial, uh, sentenced to 10 years uh, in a prison. So I am. I want to talk about the human uh, dimension of all this. You are not talking about just Ahmed Mansour, his family, his friends, his neighbors. So it is really a tragedy uh, when you uh, provide uh, oppressive governments with tools uh, to put innocent people in a prison. It is all about the lives of uh, of many activists. I have many names uh, who are in prison due to this uh, cooperation. And I think we will talk about uh, what we are doing through the coalition to uh, confront it. Thank, Thank you. you, Khaled. And yes, please hold on to that thought because I want to ask you further about the cost of surveillance and its impact, not only on the individuals hacked and infected, but also on the wider communities. Uh, but before we do that, I want to go back to uh, Masqati. So we often talk about Pegasus because obviously um, it's been making uh, headlines and a lot of scandals recently, but it's not the only company um, that is providing malicious surveillance technologies to countries in the region and beyond. Uh, so for instance, one of the, um, uh, the recent reports that came out uh, was related to another Israeli company called uh, Kandiru, and it was revealed that they um, are conducting uh, so-called watering hole attacks. So can you explain maybe in non-technical terms what these attacks are? Yeah, that's a true. I mean, NSO make a um, big story uh, because the way they infect the phones, the way they infect um, uh, human rights defenders. Um, the, the, the second company is Kandiru. Kandiru is uh, working more with the PCs, working more with operating systems like Windows and Mac OS. So recently, um, ESET, uh, the security company, find out that uh, the company infecting websites that uh, well-known websites. Uh, one of them, the Middle East Eye, uh, the website that based in UK. So the way they do it is they what we called uh, watering hole is that they inject, uh, they put a, a malicious script in in the website. And the website having what we call JavaScript that run the whole website, run uh, pictures, run a lot of stuff in the website. So when, and during the JavaScript, they can target specific person. How they target it, they, they definitely know a lot of information about the person. One of the information is about what he or she using from operating system, then what also using of a browser. And then when, when some when the target come to the website and they know that the target at least using the website one times per day, they open the doors for the target. So they ask for what they first ask if this target is using Windows or Mac OS, and they know that is Windows. So they take that target. Then they open the other doors. Okay, what he is using Firefox or Chrome or what exactly? Then they open. It's like this, it's open doors, 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 until they find that, oh, yeah, this is the person that we want. They infect his browser, then through the browser, they can infect the whole uh, computers. And 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 that's that's how it is uh, happening with uh, Kandiru. Then they can get a lot of information. I mean, more of the information is passwords that uh, already uh, saved in the browsers or password that uh, coming from uh, cookies or password coming from social media that already open or other uh, information. The, the good things about that is that when Citizen Lab did the investigation uh, before ESETS, they find that, and that investigation was with the Microsoft because Microsoft also want to to know what bugs was used to to enter their uh, operating system. So the good things about it that Windows Defender, the normal Windows Defender, can catch Kanduru. And we we uh, um, we did a manual to tell the people how they can find Kanduru in their system. So one of the things that 
is that Windows Defender can catch the Kanduro and it will start in if if you are you think that you are infected, you can log to uh, Windows Defender uh, protection history and then click on July uh, 2021. And in July, you, you will find if you are infected with the Kanduro because the the name of the spyware they're using is called uh, Devil's Tongue. And Devil Tongues, it's like the 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 name of the spyware like and it's all using uh Pegasus. so if you find this in your system that's definitely you are infected but the good things as i told you from july before the attack that happened recently is windows defender it's catch it also not only windows defender but there is also now ESET also can catch it uh casper uh before it can catch casper sky also can catch it uh, malware bytes, uh, the other company. So these companies, the four, they can catch actually uh, Kanduru. The question is, is Kanduru will plan to do something else? I mean, to change the scripts the way? Definitely. And that's what happened with Bigasus. When Bigasus, they found it in, uh, in 2016 when Ahmed Mansour was infected. You can see now from 2016 until today, Pegasus is working. How? Because they're changing a lot of mechanism in the in the spyware. And definitely Kanduru will change the mechanism. And we hope that we can catch the Kanduru. Um, the, the problem is that changing, keep changing the stuff with the spyware, it will take us longer time to find the victims. And, and that means there is more information leaked more privacy violated and that's that's the the problem if you look to bigasus we have a huge gap like i i found people infected in 2019 and we just found them so they, we're talking about like two years ago so this is the problem is that sometimes we will take longer time to find these uh spywares and if you look is what we know is kandiru and um and nso but there is other spywares that definitely we don't know. Uh, and I can, I usually use this as like a viruses in our, in a human life. That the, a lot of viruses we don't know. We know only COVID-19, but definitely there is a lot of viruses that we cannot catch and we don't know. And we cannot actually uh, have antibiotic for them. We cannot stop them sometimes to infect our phones or computers. That's an excellent point uh, you raised, Muhammad. I think uh, so far it's been a, a mouse and a, and a cat kind of game where you find out and then the companies develop uh, new ways where they can infect devices until we catch them again or researchers find out their new ways. Uh, but, I, but that, of course, leads us to the point that we need to have structural solutions to the proliferation of these surveillance technologies. Uh, from accountability to transparency to more robust expert controls. And one of the reasons why we're holding this session is to also discuss what we can do as civil society organizations to address this problem um, at its roots. But before we um, discuss this, I also wanted to ask you as a follow-up question, uh, what other surveillance technologies uh, that are commonly used by governments in the MENA region, in addition to Pegasus, um, Kandirus, um, waterhole attacks. Um, from your research and investigations, what types of surveillance technologies that are um, used uh, most commonly in, in the region? So I, we have, we can, I mean, we can, Talk about the difference between infecting the, um, people with spywares and also using um, equipments to 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 um, hack people uh, systems. Like um, one of the um, um, tools that uses Celebrites, that uh, it's a very advanced tools. Uh, definitely, they need that your phone to be present and they connect the Silbrites with your phones to to do what we call brute force attacks, to break the lock uh, and unlock in the device and then extract it, all the information to the tools. So there is, I mean, there is a lot of 
tools that used by the governments and it is just a different is if we can use these tools to infect people's uh, without um, having the phone or we we need the phones to extract the information the the problem is when 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 using like celebrate when using the tools you need the phone so you need to arrest the person to confiscate the phones you need to stop the person the borders you need to do something to get to get physically the phones with with any so and can do rule you can infect people even in exile people that you already look i mean it's not only the people that under your control uh, people that in your country inside your borders that you can control but also you can infect people in exiles that uh talking about human rights and they left your country because they are under attacks this is one of the uh, things that we need also to to look on the other things is that some of these tools is coming from really really what we call democratic countries uh i will give you example the bea system it is it is a british company but they have a big 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 um um uh, factory and big office in in where in copenhagen in denmark and when you look on denmark the uh, scandinavian countries like the the countries that raise the respect of human rights and telling that the human rights is one of the important elements so why these countries allowing that kind of tools to be sell to to a countries like saudi arabia because the system was selling to the saudi arabia and there was a um huge um uh, scandal about selling that kind of tools to monitors uh saudi and and, and also when you look our all focus recently about the human rights defender and journalists but when we move a little bit and say okay there's definitely what we called massive surveillance that everyone is under control and everyone is monitors and 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 so the the question is is and that's what NSO say we are only listening to government and and our tools is only against the bad peoples when you do massive surveillance who's the bad who's the good on that right and you you monitoring everyone in the in the state you monitoring citizen non citizen everyone in, in your uh, land and how you can find that who is bad you cannot just monitor everyone and say that i'm looking for the bad people because that is violated the privacy when even when when i i was um i saw one of the in 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 um in one of the channel in in to discuss uh the finding of frontline and one of the ex military uh, he said that we need to use bigasos even on un uh, representative because we think they are uh against our national security uh, and we need to to protect the national security so so the word of using national security the word that everyone is using you kill someone you put someone in the jail you confiscate their devices you attacking them you spying on them in a world of national security what is exactly national security what is the risk that you are facing allow you to 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 pro, uh, to to violate someone's privacy and take his or her pictures and then after years sometimes after years you publish these pictures online to just uh blackmail the person or to attack the person online and um so that's a that's a question is how we can deal with this issues in our region especially our region is the region that most of the countries is using different tools and they collect a lot of information we don't know when they will use it i mean all these victims there is a lot of information taken from their devices where is this information when they will use it how they will use it are they they will publish it in, online to just attacking them no one no yeah it's a ticking uh, bomb so to speak and uh, i do appreciate the differentiation between spyware um so targeted forms of surveillance uh, as opposed to mass surveillance 
And one knowledge gap I find in um, our region, and this is perhaps a call for all researchers that work on surveillance technologies, that we need more information on mass surveillance technologies being used in different jurisdictions in the MENA region, from facial recognition technologies to um, other forms or technologies that are used by security agencies to monitor social media posts and, and content, for instance. Uh, I guess there's a lot of research about these different viruses, to borrow your language, Mohammed, um, that are spreading uh, and uh, aiding, basically, repression. And you also touched briefly on exiled activists, and I think this is a perfect segue to uh, move to Khaled. Um, you know, many activists and journalists from the region either were exiled because their nationalities were with, with, were um, withdrawn um, by their respective governments, or they were self-exiled looking for a safe refuge to be able to exercise their rights freely and without persecution. Um, but unfortunately, digital mercenaries and surveillance uh, companies such as NSO Group, but many others have enabled governments to extend and expand the repression beyond their geographical borders. And as a result of that, we hear of many activists being uh, spied on and monitored that don't necessarily live in their home country. So can you um, share with us from the work of the Gulf uh, Center for Human Rights, how has surveillance impacted um, communities in the home country, but also activists that live um, in exile? And please unmute yourself. Yes, I will. This is a very important question. Uh, the, the, the problem that we have is resources are not available for us to face such a sophisticated attacks. I give you one example. A prominent uh, defender who is working with us, he's in exile. Uh, he put his equipment to Citizen Lab and Amnesty, and they told him that is in 2019. They told him, You are okay, they are clean. But unfortunately, in 2021, they discovered that he is a victim of Pegasus uh, project. Now, uh, of course, that will affect the way we are doing uh, our human rights work in, in exile. Uh, as you know, there are other uh, victims, uh, even uh, uh, Jamal Khashoggi himself. Uh, he's a victim of uh, uh, civilians. And uh, if we go further, we see that there are many other names, such as uh, Ala Sadiq, who passed away in the UK in a car uh, um, accident. In general, uh, we, in, we are working in exile. We are trying our best to meet our obligations to uh, to do our human rights work. But uh, really, uh, we left uh, behind, uh, if you look at the size of uh, attack, the size of cooperation, uh, I know that some advocacy efforts uh, managed to force some companies such as uh, Apple to sue uh, NSO, but that is not enough. Uh, still, uh, we have uh, reliable reports coming from uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia, they have a, a strong cooperation and they are sharing whatever they have, the surveillance equipment with other uh, Gulf countries, probably with other countries in the MENA region. And we have to uh, look at all these uh, security treaties. They are directed to uh, dismantle the work of human rights defenders in exile. Just recently, the cabinet of ministers in UAE, they put four human rights defenders on the terrorism list. Now today, unfortunately, today is a very bad day for democracy. Uh, General, Major General Ahmed Nasser al-Risi elected as a president of the Interpol. And we believe strongly they are going to misuse the uh, red notice uh, system within the Interpol, taking into account that all the defenders, mostly they are working in exile across the Gulf countries, even Egypt, Syria. So we are at really uh, imminent risk and we have 
just to find uh, uh, ways to protect uh, uh, human rights uh, defenders, bloggers, and journalists who are working in exile. There are many options available to us. I know that uh, our resources are limited, but still, uh, with our advocacy and with our uh, cooperation, we could make a change. Thank you, Khaled. And I know that the Gulf Center has recently filed a petition on behalf of, I believe, six surveillance victims in, in France. So can you share more information about this lawsuit? And you, if you think litigation uh, would help uh, seek justice and accountability for victims? Thank you, Marwa, for this question. This is very important. You know why? Uh, because really in our region, there is no any uh, local remedy. Like uh, Khalid Umair, a defender in Saudi Arabia, made a complaint against a, an officer who tortured him when he was in prison. And then again, he, he disappeared in prison. Uh, so the fact that there is no any uh, local remedy, we use the concept of international jurisdiction to uh, make a case uh, against us uh, NSO uh, in cooperation with the human rights uh, lawyers, William Borden and Vincent uh, Bringard. Uh, it is still, the, the case is still before the French uh, public uh, prosecutor. We mentioned many names. I could say that we mentioned Ahmed Mansour in this case, Ala Sadiq, Yahya uh, Al Asiri. Uh, the good news, uh, we are not alone who filed a case against an NSO group in France. With us also newspaper uh, media part and also uh, reporters without borders. These cases are very important. Uh, it is going to uh, separate fears among those uh, uh, companies who are supporting oppressive governments. And also uh, it is very important for us to uh, uh, take this uh, option. Uh, this is uh, the only option available for us. Uh, and as you see, international advocacy, including uh, cases using the international jurisdiction, the, both they are very important for uh, the protection of defenders, journalists, and bloggers, again, uh, across the MENA region. Thank you, Khaled. And while I have you, and since you already mentioned advocacy, uh, bear with us, Mohammed. Uh, we'll come back to you. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, we recently launched the MENA Surveillance Coalition, and the aim of it really is to first map all the different actors as to the extent that we can, and based on you know publicly available information, of course, noting that the surveillance industry is opaque um, and hard to really uh, map. Uh, nevertheless, I think um, having a sort of database would provide a bit of uh, transparency and an understanding of who are these companies um, that sell these technologies, but also to work together collectively as regional and global organizations um, to think of ways, campaigns, um, using different human rights mechanisms um, in order to ensure that the flow of these surveillance technologies from um, the global north mainly, uh, plus Israel, to the rest of countries or governments in the region. And so can you maybe um, share with the audience uh, more about this coalition, uh, its activities, and also uh, perhaps a call for those who are interested in our audience that are uh, that would like to join uh, what would be the way forward thank you so much uh, marwa the reality uh, this coalition was born in, uh, in uh, right corn 2019 we started from there access now initiated together with, with you know, with some talks with the, the Gulf Central Human Rights and other human rights partners, we started to uh, look at uh, this important issue to share resources, to confront uh, the exploitation of uh, civilians equipment to uh, the MENA region. And then uh, your, your uh, uh, role in uh, initiating a, a lot of uh, meetings, we discussed that, and then we managed uh, uh, to uh, really uh, make the announcement uh, of, the, of the MENA coalition to combat digital surveillance. Tahalif uh, al on the 7th of June uh, 2021. 
uh, at the moment, uh, we have uh, uh, many uh, other NGOs with us, uh, such as Article Now, uh, Article 19, uh, co uh, Committee to Protect uh, Journalists, Frontline Defenders, uh, Human Rights Watch, mentioned by, uh, um, by uh, 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 Marwa. And there are others. Uh, we are really uh, happy to welcome uh, new members. We are working uh, on the mapping of uh, companies, Western companies that are supporting oppressive governments, but still, uh, really, we are uh, trying our best to include all people who are involved in the work uh, to end uh, the, the, the exportation of uh, civilian uh, technology from the West to oppressive governments in the, in the MENA. Uh, all the people are welcome. I think uh, Marwa is here. We will leave uh, an email for you if you want to communicate with us. Uh, and her email is very easy, marwa at accessnow.org. You could uh, email Marwa. Uh, she is, uh, I have to thank her. She's doing the uh, coordination uh, uh, task for this uh, coalition. Hopefully, we will have a new staff within Access Now to deal with the lot of other issues related to uh, coordinating the efforts between uh, the various members. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Khaled, and uh, I will share later during the session a link where you can apply if you would like to become a member of the coalition and also an open call to everybody if you would like to volunteer in this research project, you're more than welcome, please do get in touch. It's a very ambitious project and we welcome um, any support, especially from researchers on surveillance technologies. Um, I want to come back to you, Mohammed, and it's actually a question from the audience, and it's a question that I had um, originally planned to ask you. And obviously, when we discuss uh, Pegasus project, um, sorry, Pegasus spyware uh, and surveillance technologies, the first pressing question that comes to mind is how can I protect them myself and my devices? Um, and so I know that with zero click. Uh, kind of attacks, it becomes hard um, to offer digital security tips, but you're the expert. So uh, I'm sure many of us uh, on this call today or in the session would like to know how we can exactly do that to protect ourselves and the people we work with. Um, first, let's 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 think about um, something important that also questions that uh, I'm using signal uh, definitely they don't know what I'm saying <coughs> sorry Pegasus is infect your phone and infect my phone that mean you are giving your phone to um, to somebody else to look on your phone so when you are when you're sending something to anybody using a signal the encryption is happening not in not inside the phone because you see the the writing you are writing the things but the encryption <coughs> during the trans transmitted of the content to the other person so that's that's how it is so using a signal it will not prevent that no one can see what you're writing if your phone is already infected that's the question so the second thing is with with Pegasus and the way is working. So the biggest is it's working on finding bugs and vulnerability in our devices. Then when they find that they don't tell the government, they don't tell the company, they don't inform the company. They use that to change the spyware to work on that bugs and vulnerabilities. And so they can infect our phone without needing to click on anything as you say it's zero click so the question is how we can prevent us from this and that simple question we cannot be safe from zero click but when you look on so when they the biggest uh, and nso and other company working very hard to find these bugs and they pay millions to find these bugs right so to to break that is there's only one method to do it is to update your operating system and applications because when when you update that that bugs is useless is not anymore working 
And that's what happened with iMessage, uh, with uh, WhatsApp, with other uh, applications. This is the main thing. So what I can give advice, update your operating system and apps. Secondly, one of the things that I, when I, I worked in Pegasus case and I found that, <coughs> sorry, is that most of the people, the most of the human rights defenders and journalists, they, they download apps. And that's not only with Pegasus, but with other um, um, uh, malwares that there was a malware uh, actually in in palestine before bigasus by the way the malware is that palestinian authority atta used to attack human rights defenders using the facebook and facebook closed their account so that malware is is apt to download in your it's like really um simple malware is built on operating and on, on open source but people is first downloading any apps from anywhere that's one of the things, okay? Because sp spyware is not Pegasus only. Spyware, there is a lot, a lot of spywares in our phones that we don't understand. So one of the, th the problems I see that people download any apps from anywhere. And they when they download it, that's one of the problems because these apps could be infect your phones. Not Pegasus, maybe there is something else. That's one thing. Secondly, people download a lot of apps and then they don't use them. Like between years, they use them one time. Many of these apps, Marwa, they, the developers, they just forget about them. And there is no more update for them. And people, they just keep them in their phone. And when there is a lot of apps in Android, infected and people they just don't um uh, supporting them with update but still people use them because you know they, they download it and they don't take it out uh, for years and they find that oh it's infected because the app was in the bugs and no one is developing this app so so these things i know it will not prevent the spyware it just will reduce that's what the question reduce the risk uh, on us because when imp when when you get infected the impact is really high not on you only as as Khalid say not it just not on you it, in, it's the impact on your family colleagues friend everyone in your environment everyone in your environment there is a huge impact what we do with small steps it just reducing the impact and that impact can be mitigated. So that's what we need to focus more. A lot of people, they just want a, a one magic app. You install it, it will encrypt the phone, protect the phone, uh, do a VPN, and uh, uh, clean the phone, uh, do everything. I don't know, I mean, everything. That's the, the, the question is, there is no such a, uh, as the app can do everything. No, it just, Sometimes it's a behavior. Do update, don't download a uh, uh, suspicious app, and just remove apps that you don't need. So that's the main things that I can say about it. This is excellent, Muhammad. Thank you so much. Uh, I have uh, one more question as a follow-up. So um, there is often also this advice floating that uh, you know restarting your device would help against uh, Pegasus, and I'm not sure if this is actually true or it's an urban legend <laughs> being propagated online. It's not with the Pegasus only. It's with all the uh, uh, spyware. Why? Because I will tell you how Pegasus is sending information. So Pegasus need to have a server, hmm. and that server is communicating with your phone. And how it is communicating with your phone? By the internet. So when you do a restart to your uh, app, to, to your phone, it is re back again to to try to communicate with the server and this is it's important i i know uh, people they don't do restart for their phone for weeks and i know people they don't do restart for their computer because they don't want to reopen all the apps again and that's the worst because restarting is restarting everything's in the computer the rom the cache the cookies the de de deleting a lot of stuff so always at the end of the day, just restart it. It will take a few minutes from you and that's it. It will help you a lot because 
restarting, it will cut the communications that already started with uh, 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 what we call it a command control server, the C and C server that sending and receiving information uh, for the malicious software. So yeah, start your phones, um, uh, restart your phones, folks, or let your battery die as I usually have my phone do. Um, there's another question to you, Maskati, about uh, digital security and from Rima. Um, she says that most forensic research reports are focused on Apple phones. Is there research to extend the scans to Android phones? Sorry, Android Android phones, as they they are more. Sorry, uh, they are more used in our region. So what, why why it is Android not? Uh, why iPhone not Android? iPhone keep all the logs in the system. All the logs for a long time. And that's good and bad. Good that we, we, we can analyze it and easy to analyze it because all what you did, you, you called someone, you did something, there is a crash, there is something bad. All these logs, it's in your system. And the iPhone is keep that logs. But in Android is different because the logs, every time you restart your phone, the logs restarted also. And this is a good because it's our, your privacy will be protected, but it's not good for the security researcher because they cannot reach to that logs. I mean, we're trying to do something else. We're trying to get some information that uh, is not really... Uh, um, uh, we, we, we will not know exactly that if Pegasus or not, but it could be some trace or some crash reports happening because when Pegasus work, there is a process and that's how we can know. Like there is a process happening and this process is connected to the Pegasus. So maybe it's one of these process crashed WhatsApp because it's monitoring WhatsApp and they crash together and there will be crash report. So we will know that, oh, there is a crash report. Oh, who, why they, there is a crash report? Oh, they, there is a big SS is working. So we will know that, oh, there is a big SS in Android. Otherwise, there is really a few times that we notice, like in Bahrain, there was someone have an Android. We get, we know that he's uh, infected by message because there is a message he received he click on that message from the telecommunication and he get infected so we know that by this message is with the link is communicating with bigasus server we didn't know that that he is infected uh, by bigasus by uh, the, re, the 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 logs report because that will not be included i mean in the report so that's how i mean the different why it's it's iphone not um android but still i mean we're trying to 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 find a lot of ways like we are working now to find different ways and um the, the reports the bug reports and other things that we trying to collect to understand how we can uh find bigger source trace on that thank you Mohammed. i'm conscious of time so we have seven minutes left and we have an interesting question uh from one of our participants um actually before our session today there was an announcement from reported by israeli media that the the israeli military uh, ministry of defense is restricting the sale of cyber technologies to i believe 65 countries um so the list um of countries that the Israeli companies are allowed to export their surveillance technologies or cyber technologies to were around 102, and now it's down to um, 37 countries. And some interesting countries that were taken off the list are uh, Mexico, Morocco, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia. So the question here is, we know these countries also purchase cyber tech from other countries like China, how do you see this decision unfolding? And maybe I give it first to Khaled. 
I don't think that is going to have any impact on the activities of uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia. Uh, for example, uh, our website and thousands of other websites are blocked using equipment uh, sent uh, from Canada by NetSweeper. There are many companies and they have a lot of money. And even this decision, we, we don't know whether it's reliable or it's just, uh, as you know yourself, uh, they are putting six uh, purely human rights organizations on the, the list of terrorism. And now they are saying we are not going to sell uh, uh, equipment, uh, surveillance equipment to UAE and Saudi Arabia. Who is going to believe them? I myself, I don't think uh, I am going to put that much on it. Amen to that. I think I'm in the same uh, category. I don't trust that this would happen. And there's actually an interesting follow-up question that uh, provides maybe an answer to Mira's question. Is that how do you think Israeli companies selling surveillance tech in repressive regimes will bypass the span, knowing that some companies, and namely actually NSO Group, um, had sold their technologies from Cyprus, Bulgaria, um, and potentially other company, other countries? I want to add to this, actually, I, this is totally, it is a good news, I'm not saying it's a bad news, but there is a country is going to, to buy it through proxy. I will give you an example. There is a company in UAE called Al Fahad. This company is buying this and give these uh, tools to Egypt, as an example. When, we, when you look on the tracing or the route of that tools or that things is going from one place to other place, and you will find that is going to that company in, in, in Dubai or Abu Dhabi. But then this company, they don't understand how that tools went to Egypt, right? So yeah, that's true. I mean, they it will not sell to them directly, but it is there is a proxy. There is um, proxy going from one country to another country, and that's the worst, by the way. I mean, I sell to uh, I sell to a, a company. I will know that this a company get my tools, and there is operating. Uh, system for them and the, there is a code i will <clears throat> know them when it's going through proxy you will not know them because that code will be i mean disappeared and they can still use the the spyware without tracing them and that's the worst actually so i think we need beyond of that we need to put really rules on it it's not only selling to that company uh, to, to, to that country, it's fine, or prevent them to get that spyware, it's fine. No, we need to put rules from the beginning that even if you sell it to this company, these rules that you're not allowed to 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 um, to subtract it to another uh, countries, you're not allowed to use it without a court order, you're not allowed to do this and this. So this is one of the things, it's a very important steps that I think NGOs is pushing, human rights uh, advocate is pushing, and also the victims is pushing because they are their privacy violated. I just, uh, Marwa, just uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I just add to that, like they have uh, security treaties with Jordan, with other uh, countries. So even if they are on the list, they use others uh, to buy whatever they want uh, without, as Mohammed suggested, without. Uh, a uh, complete mechanism to monitor uh, the sale of surveillance equipment. We are not going to go anywhere to end this uh, sale. Actually, speaking of which, um, Israel and Morocco just uh, signed yesterday their first official defense agreement. Um, so it's interesting to see that they were removed off the list. While in fact, so who knows that there might be other sorts of technologies and arms sales uh, as part of that cooperation or memorandum of understanding. We have one last minute, and maybe if I can give you, maybe Khaled, uh, if you wrap us up with recommendations of where we can go from here and what we need to do as civil society organizations. Unmute Khaled. <laughs> uh, thank you, Marwa. Really, I promise people to speak some. Uh, uh, of uh, my speech in uh, classical Arabic. So I will repeat what you said that uh, 
تحالف التحالف يرحب بجميع منظمات المجتمع المدني التي تعمل على الدفاع على حريه التعبير والحقوق الاساسيه لتصبح عضوا فعالا تعالوا لان نتشارك كل الطاقات لكي يكون عملنا جماعيا وهذا نجاح للمجتمع المدني الهجمه كبيره ونحتاج كل الطاقات وهذا هو ندائي بالعربيه وكرره بعد ان اطلقت النداء باللغه الانجليزيه زميلتي الفاضله الاستاذه uh marwa well the last thing i will i, I want to say that we will continue uh, our work we are not going to stop uh, whatever uh, the size of that that we are going to continue our work and we believe uh, the peaceful changes coming in our region maybe it will take time thank you thank you so much khaled and masqati for your sh for sharing your time and expertise with us i hope that was uh, useful uh, for our audience i added the link to join the coalition in the chat box if you're interested please do not hesitate to get in touch thank you again everybody for joining us and i wish you a further successful events and sessions at brethrenet thanks you marwa thanks khaled thank you